Hi everybody and welcome to another digital piano video here on Miriam Piano's YouTube. My name is Stu Harrison. This video is going out to all you parents and shoppers who are just starting up piano lessons. Somebody's told you, hey, do you have anything at home? And you're now hitting the stores or the internet figuring out what digital piano you're gonna bring home so that you can get the lessons started this fall. We're gonna be talking about the various price ranges you're likely to encounter and for me, why you should be looking at those two. Uh, so generally, we're really talking about is it worth it to go up from the baseline price if you're shopping for a digital piano? If it's the first time that you've seen us here on YouTube, thank you so much for finding us. We're really happy that you're stopping by. Hit that subscribe and the notification bell either right now or at any point in the video where you're like, yeah, that made sense. I enjoyed that. We'd love to have you back. Uh, participating in comments or just passively enjoying the videos uh, in the background either way would be great without further ado let's jump right into today's topic is it worth it to spend more on a digital piano So we're in the summer of 2022 and in North America, school gets back in uh, usually in August or September, depending on where you are, what state, what province. Uh, and it is a busy time for the piano industry. A lot of parents out there doing their shopping uh, and more and more the instrument of choice to get started with is a digital piano. Uh, when a parent who is not a musician wades into the digital piano industry, uh, they are either going to make a very quick choice because they don't really want to engage in the research process or they're going to wade into a pretty thick melee of specifications and having to learn all sorts of different lingo to try and discern what a good digital piano might be. So in this video we're going to be talking about the impact of budget on the shopping process or in short is it worth it to spend more money on a digital piano versus just keeping the budget nice and low. Like most things, there's not just a simple answer to that question because it really depends on who's asking it. For a parent looking at a first time player, that is going to be one answer. For a professional who knows exactly what they're looking for uh, and has a very discerning ear and touch, well, that's gonna be a separate answer. Uh, and then of course you've got people who are primarily focused on sound, uh, maybe either audio files or just for hobby, they're really, really focused uh, on getting a great, great piano uh, acoustic tone. Well, that might be kind of a third subset of people. In this video though, we are going to focus on parents and hobbyists who are getting into piano lessons for the first time because I think that is the crowd in which this question is probably the most daunting and the most relevant. Does it make sense to invest beyond the baseline budget for a digital piano. So first of all, let's start with what a digital piano costs these days. Uh, most people uh, use the word piano once you start talking about 88 keys. Uh, it's hardly a science. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of cheating going on from uh, you know, uh, article to article, brand to brand. But I think for the most part, when it's less than 88 keys and not weighted, it's generally referred to as a keyboard. When it is 88 keys and either semi-weighted or fully weighted, then it's referred to as a digital piano. So for a digital piano weighted, uh, about the lowest price that you are now going to come across in the marketplace is in and around the $500 range. That is no longer gonna be for a product from some of the biggest manufacturers. This is now going to be for some of the off-brand or newly branded products coming out of China. Donner would be one of those uh, options. I've seen a few others uh, out there that seem to be a bit of a revolving door in terms of what brand is stuck on it, but certainly some lower cost Asian factories producing off-brand or stencil branded digital pianos. And those are gonna start up in in and around the $500 range. You might find one for 450, 429, but it's kind of in that range. And before you get into a really well branded product, um, which means generally better manufactured product, and that could be from 
uh, any of the big companies, uh, Yamaha, Kawai, Roland, Casio, uh, Korg, uh, these are the big players you're going to find uh, in that space. You are going to need to invest about $200 more up into around the $700 range and then you're getting the first examples of weighted 88 note pianos from those companies. In the piano world, it's a bit of a endless debate over whether touch is a higher priority than sound. Uh, and uh, even on this channel, it's a topic that comes up most often. Um, I have two different answers depending on whether you're talking about a digital piano or an acoustic piano. To me, touch is more critical on a digital. Uh, I, I tend to out-prioritize it over sound. Uh, on an acoustic, uh, I actually think it's a little on the opposite side. Um, I tend to prioritize the thing that you can't do anything about. So on a digital piano, the action is the action. You can't get in there and regulate it. You can't change it. Uh, it sort of has whatever its lifespan is kind of pre-baked in when you first get it. Uh, and that's your main interface uh, with the instrument. There's usually lots that you can do to modify the sound that you're receiving on the other end of that. So action is what I tend to prioritize when it comes to digitals. When we're talking about acoustics, well, action uh, can be regulated. You can really work quite a bit with it. Uh, and while design and geometry certainly have a lot to do with an action's feel, uh, one of the biggest factors is simply how many hours it's been worked on, fine-tuned, and regulated. So there tends to be a lot you can actually do with action to influence how fluid it feels, how heavy, how light, repetition speed. Uh, it tends to be um, more on the uh, malleable side Whereas the tone of the piano, uh, its sustain, you know, where all those sweet spots are, are kind of baked into each individual instrument. And so on the acoustic side, I tend to prefer or prioritize rather tone. So all this to say that if we're talking about digital pianos, it is my firm recommendation that touch be a significant priority. Um, I don't think that I'd be alone in this. I think there's a lot of teachers who would probably uh, suggest the same because when you are first starting out, your ear isn't necessarily all that developed. Neither are your fingers, but one of the things that you're gonna be working on as a priority as a young student is going to be touch. It is starting to develop your control of your fingers. It is starting to learn how to create a louder sound or a softer sound, not using the volume knob, but actually just using the different pressure that you're applying with your finger on the key. The more consistent each key feels from key to key, the closer that that key feels to an acoustic piano, and if you're intending on having the instrument around for four or five years, the more likely that key is to make it through without starting to click um, and or need a repair uh, or have some type of a sensor within the action stop functioning. Well, quality and durability on that action is pretty important. This is where I would say you don't want to skimp. There are a few examples of great action out there uh, that you can access for a relatively low cost. Um, I still continue to favor one of the actions in the marketplace called the Roland PHA4. I find uh, that it tends to have the most lifelike feel uh, to me as a player. Uh, grain of salt, there is no absolutely definitive answer to what the best action is. is all is a very, very personal thing, but for me, that's the one that I tend to think delivers uh, probably the most authentic feel for the price uh, in this opening price range. Um, but Kawai has a newer action called uh, the Responsive Hammer Compact 2. Uh, that one is gonna be an interesting action. Uh, the Yamaha action in this range is a GHS. Uh, it's a slightly simpler action, but certainly there's a lot of people out there who've had positive experiences with the GHS. Uh, Casio is uh, coming out actually with a new action, uh, which is going to be uh, not quite as cheap as this, but accessible uh, probably in the mid-teens. And in this range, their action that they have is a smart scaled action. Um, so you can go out to stores, try a number of these, but I would say if you're trying to figure out uh, what to focus on and you're working with a teacher or a friend or you yourself have played a little bit in this price range the priority that I would make is action if you have the budget 
to move it from that 700 range up to say the 1000 to 1500 range, then you can start to combine, um, I would say, action and onboard speaker quality. Why am I not saying Tone Engine in this price range? Well, because if you're buying it to practice and you're buying it to play, most people are still gonna be playing this instrument without headphones the majority of time versus with. And so the quality of the speakers on board that instrument to me at this price point is probably more critical than the signal it generates out of its headphone, um, uh, its headphone port because you tend to get a bit of an artificial sense of dynamics and control when you play exclusively with headphones unless you're experienced enough to really know how to set that up and kind of compare the experience to that of an acoustic. And so if you can move up and, you be, and you're able to prioritize speakers, that means you're going to get a piano that has a nice dynamic range, it's got a full sound, you're gonna to want to play it, you're gonna enjoy playing it. Uh, to me, this hits the sweet spot for the majority of first time digital piano buyers is kind of in that low to mid teen range um, where you know across many manufacturers there tends to be a couple of instruments that really hit that 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 kind of sweet spot where you've got a good action and really starting to get some nice fuller sounding onboard speakers the features are still going to be very very low beyond that price point you're going to now start to hit um, into the 2000 up to 2500 and for a beginner player, the only reason why, in my opinion, it makes sense to actually spend that much money is if you've got multiple players in the house who are going to get um, a lot of use out of this because you usually get a higher build quality at this, at this price point. Uh, the second reason is if your intent was to have this instrument be a more long-term instrument. When you get into the 20 to 25 hundred dollar price range for a digital piano now you're looking at a really solid action not necessarily to top action but an action that's going to accommodate most players up until let's say about a grade 8 conservatory level with with uh, with pretty uh, pretty convincing authenticity you've got some nice full speakers delivering a pretty full spectrum of tone uh, and now you've added some complexity and some nuance to uh, the piano uh, tone generator uh, with the durability to give you probably you know seven to ten years worth of trouble for use. So for beginners who aren't advanced enough to really be able to hear great sound, they don't really have a sense of, of uh, you know action in terms of what they like but they know they're, they want to take this seriously or as I said uh, if you've got multiple people in the home who are going to be putting a lot of hours on this that's where I think your $2,000-$2,500 price range could actually be quite justifiable. Moving beyond that, you're going to now get into your higher end home digital pianos. These are instruments with far more complex tone generators, multi-speaker uh, stereo systems built into them, and in some cases, or in a lot of cases, you're getting kind of digital hybrid actions. That These are actions in which one or more elements are really starting to mimic acoustic piano keys in terms of material or geometry. These pianos are almost exclusively focused towards people who already know how to play, have developed a bit of a taste, can sit, step into a showroom, compare two or three of these side by side, uh, and really uh, narrow in on one that they resonate with. For people who have never played before, this is gonna be a tricky uh, range to start to discern. I, it's not all that dissimilar uh, to uh, somebody just equating themselves with wine, for example. Um, most people who have never had wine before can tell the difference between a red wine or a white wine and maybe something that's really sweet or very dry but that might be all that their palate can really uh, discern. When you get a little bit into it, uh, most people are gonna be able to tell the difference between say a $10 bottle of wine and a $20 bottle of wine. But it takes quite a refined palate to consistently be able to pick out a 40 or $50 bottle of wine from a $20 bottle of wine. And that's the range to me that you start to get at once you clear about the $3,000 price range in a digital piano. 
experienced players, even people who have been playing for two or three years, will be able to tell that price range apart from the $2,000 price range quite easily. Those who are completely fresh may really be straining to hear the difference or straining to feel the difference. That pretty well wraps up the whole set of digital pianos that you as a parent or parents or hobby players or brand new students are likely to be exposed to or shown when you go into a digital piano store this fall to start up your piano lessons. Uh, digital pianos of course go all the way up to $20,000 but in my opinion most people are not going to be shown or introduced to models that really exceed anything much beyond that three maybe four thousand dollar mark uh, when you're just starting out. Of course uh, if you've got the economic freedom to do so there are some wonderful instruments out there uh, from several of the top companies that you may want to consider. Uh, in the very high end uh, Kawhi, Yamaha and Roland all have models uh, that cater to that market You've got the Avant series, the N series, and the Yamaha. You've got your NV series with Kawhi. Uh, certainly, that's a personal favorite of mine. Uh, and then on Roland, you've got your GP and your LX series. Lots of great stuff there. Uh, but as I said, usually focus towards people who've really developed a preference at that point. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope, specifically to parents who are just wading into this and don't really know where to start their search that this has been a helpful video in terms of helping you uh, determine uh, what a budget range is that you might want to consider. We have a number of other videos on the channel which I'd encourage you to watch talking about specific digital piano models under certain uh, price points. We'll put some of those links in the description below. Stick around on the channel, watch a few more, and hopefully we've been able to help you land at a decision a little easier and maybe with a little more fun. My name is Stu Harrison. This is Miriam Pianos on YouTube. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you soon.